Now we start the next pericope in Revelation 19 or the Apocalypse 19. And it starts with verse 11. The rider on the white horse. And I stare at to discern the sky which has been opened up. And you must yourself stare at to discern a white horse and the one sitting himself down in place upon it, being called trustworthy and true. And in equity, he is dividing through decision and he is fighting in war. What is it that we can't understand here? John was staring at the sky to try to discern what was going on because it had been opened up. Then he said that we also must stare at to discern to see a white horse and someone who's sitting himself down in place who is being called, being called trustworthy and true through justice and through equity. He's dividing through decision and he's fighting in war. Now, wars are not always just wars. We know that. But in this case, it is saying that this is a war that is just because he is able to, and he actually does, divide through decision with equity. He calls someone evil who really is evil, and he calls someone good who really is good. And he makes war against the ones who are evil. Verse 12. But his eyes are a flashing blaze of a fire, and upon his head are many thin diadems all about. Him holding names having been written, and a name having been written, which no one at all has seen except only him. Now, it sounds complicated. It's not so complicated. When you look at his eyes or a flashing blaze of a fire, do we know what that fire is? Well, we have a fire which is repeatedly talked about here in Revelation, the Apocalypse, and particularly in these two chapters. And that's the fire that is in the lake, the restrictive lake of the fire. Uh, some people call that restrictive lake hell. That's not correct. Because we'll find in chapter 20 that hell is thrown into it. So it cannot be it because it's thrown into it. And hell is temporary. It's not a place where people will be forever. Because it says, and hell emptied out those who were in it. And then it itself is thrown into the restrictive lake of fire. So the restrictive lake of fire is something which is eternal, which is an irrevocable punishment, and into which hell is thrown. So this fire is the ultimate fire, even, even more vicious than the fires of hell. And when we look at his eyes, they are flashing blaze of a fire. And that's in the context of him executing the judgment of God. So, yes, we can make that association between the fire that's in the eyes of the rider on the white horse and the fire that burns in the restrictive lake. It's ignited by God-like sulfur or the eternal irrevocable punishment happens. And that same fire that punishes those wicked is blazing in his eyes as he executes war against them. Upon his head are many thin diadems all about. Very interesting. So he has authority, many authorities that are represented on his head. We don't know what that refers to. We don't know what it refers to. But it says him holding names having been written and a name having been written, which no one at all has seen. Now that which is a singular which. So that's referring to the name, a name having been written, which no one at all has seen except him. There's one name that only he has seen. No one else has seen that has been written, and he's kept concealed. But there are other names that have been written for him, but it doesn't say what those are. And so when we have someone coming along, trying to exercise witchcraft, which is what it is, I've got a video on it, 
I think I do. I'll see if I, I think I made that video. I, I don't know if I made it or not, but I think so. And exercising witchcraft by saying you have to, you cannot use the word Jesus. you got to use this word, not even the Greek word, right? Yeshua, right? Or some other variation they come up with because they're always correcting themselves, right? And coming up with another version saying, oh, well, what I said you must use before, I know, you, got, you must use this now. That's witchcraft. They're trying to find the exact word so that they could leverage God. Because if they don't, God's not going to listen to them. That's how they think. It's like the Jehovah's Witnesses, same thing they went through, where they said that you have to refer to God as Jehovah and nothing else. Not God, nothing else. And they said Jesus was not God. Because otherwise you could use the name of Jesus, right? So they said Jehovah, which was... Uh, that was wrong anyway. They were trying to put it into English words, the Tetragrammaton, Y-H-W-H. That's transliter transliteration of it. We don't know for sure. The pronunciation of God's name was lost in history because the Jews considered it too sacred to pronounce. At least that's what we're told. And so when Christ came, that was the practice. But when we look in the Old Testament, that's not the practice. Because they actually say, I will declare your name. And so if it's too holy to declare, then they can't say that they're going to declare his name or they do declare his name. All right, well, that's a tangent, though, right? So this issue about the names that he holds, it's a difficult issue, isn't it? What names? We don't know. We don't know. Could be referring to the different translations of the name of Jesus. So in each language, how it's translated. Don't discount translations of names. Just because we have a tendency nowadays, as we've experienced globalization in a smaller world, where we have a tendency to pronounce someone's name from their original language instead of translated, like Janusz. Well, Janusz was translated John, often for a long time, John or Jan, but Janusz. And so people say Janusz. Well, okay, that's fine, but that doesn't mean translating it is wrong, because it does translate to John. And you still can be referring to the person by that. And here it says that Jesus has many names, or the rider on the white horse, at least. And so he has many names. So if you refer to him by any of those names, you're still referring to him by his name. But if you're an English speaker, and you're trying to use Hebrew or Aramaic in order to be correct with God, you're practicing witchcraft, and you need to cease. Use the name of Jesus that is your native tongue. If it's Greek, use the Greek word. If it's Spanish, use the Spanish word. If it's English, use the English word. And when you're speaking with other people in a language together, common language like English, don't go using Spanish. Don't go using the Greek. Don't go using the Hebrew or Aramaic. Use the English. It says right here, him holding names having been written. They're all valid. Verse 13. And he having been thrown all about with a garment which has been baptized in blood. Baptized means completely submersed. Baptized in blood. He's got a garment on. This baptized in blood is completely covered in blood. The name of him is also being called the Word of God. Now you ask, whose blood? Probably didn't ask that, right? But you should. Baptized in blood. His garment is baptized in blood. Now look at this. You think, well, that's the blood of his enemies. No, 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 no. Hold on a minute. When else do we see a garment? We saw it up here. Verse 8. And it is given to her in order that she throws all around herself radiant and purged clean linen. Okay, same thing as what it says down here. He having been thrown all about with a garment. Notice he didn't throw it around himself. It was thrown on him, the garment which has been baptized in blood. The name of him is also being called the word of God. Verse 8, that she throw all around herself, radiant and purged clean linen. The bride of Christ, we, throw all around ourselves a garment. We do it ourselves. With Jesus, his was done to him. For the linen, verse 8, is being the equitable actions of the terrifyingly clean ones. And he, having been thrown all about with a garment, which has been baptized in blood, the name of him is also being called the Word of God. So now we see that he's the Word of God, 
And if we go back to John 1.1, 1, 1, we know this is Jesus. How do we know it's Jesus? It says, in Archein ho logos, kai ho logos, and proston theon. I theos in ho logos. In the beginning, an authority was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The word was with God in the beginning. And in verse 14, it says, and he came and tinted among us, and goes on to talk about Jesus. So we know who the word of God is. It is not the Bible. The Bible is not the word of God. Absolutely not. It never says that in the Bible. In fact, it repeatedly tells us that Jesus is the word of God. So stop your idolatry, where you're exalting the Bible to the second person of the Trinity, who was with God and was God in the beginning. The word of God was with God and was God in the beginning. If you're calling the Bible the word of God, you're saying the Bible was with God and was God in the beginning. And there is a religion who does have a book who, which they worship as God. The Sikhs. They actually, I've been in the temple up in Vancouver where they have a glass room on the second floor and a giant bed. And in that glass room, you can see from all sides as you're walking down this giant corridor. You can see from all sides this bed with a gigantic book lying in it that's about the size of a man. And there is a, a priest who is constantly chanting mantras night and day. And they put this book in this bed and to sleep and they treat it like God and they give it offerings. Don't be like the heathen who do not know God. Whose blood is this that Jesus was baptized in except his own? This is the blood of Christ which his garment was baptized in, in which was thrown all about him, which is also pointing to the burial cloth that he was wrapped in, that he did not wrap himself in. The clothes that he went to, went on the arrest with, he put on himself that day. The next clothes that would be put on him were put on him that he did not put on himself. And those are the burial clothes. And you could say those are baptized in blood because he was dead. Verse 14. And the armies, as one, the ones in the heaven, was being without any other road except his, who was upon the white horse, having sunk himself down in a white, purged, clean linen. So now it's not a bloody one. Now it's a white, purged, clean linen. This indicates his glorified body. No sign of blood here. White, purged, clean linen. Remember, white, purged, clean refers to the righteous deeds, the terrifyingly clean ones. In this case, his own righteous deeds. All right, so in the armies as one, the ones in the heaven, was being without any other road except his. They were absolutely focused without any backup plan, without any alternative, they would absolutely not hear any alternative to the road of Christ, the road of the rider on the white horse. They were faithful and true as he is faithful and true. Verse 15, And from out of his mouth, the rider on the white horse, a sharp double-edged saber pierces to traverse out... That's that word for piercing again, with ek on the front, out of. In order that in that sword, in this sword, it doesn't say with this sword, it says in this sword, in order that in that sword he may strike a single swift sting on the ethnicities. He's not destroying them. It doesn't say that. And he will shepherd them in an iron stick. So he doesn't destroy them. Some of them may die from it, but he's not trying to destroy all the ethnicities. He's trying to sting them so that he may rule them as a shepherd with an iron stick. And he is tramp. And those of you who say that Jesus is peaceful and gentle and well, yes, he is that, but he's also this. Where he has a saber that's got two edges that are sharp and he strikes to sting 
the ethnicities in order to get them back into line so that he can then shepherd them with an iron staff, an iron stick. Not wooden, iron. So when he hits them, it hurts. Much worse than a piece of wood. A piece of wood gives. Iron does not. Iron is unforgiving. And he is tramping on the wine vat of the wine from the passion to rush in with hard breath to sacrifice, the fury of mind reaching forth to grasp from the God of Almighty Vigor. All right, so this is tough. What is the wine vat of the wine from this passion and this fury? What is it? Well, a wine vat holds the grapes, and you tramp them in order to get the juice out. And what is that wine then? Is it the blood of people? Like in Armageddon, where it talks about it going up to the bridles for a certain distance. You can watch this video where I calculate how many people had to die in order to produce that much blood. Because they say specifically how much blood. Very interesting. Go watch the video. Well, it doesn't say in the text, does it? It doesn't say. Does it have something to do with the ethnicities? Yeah, it does. Because that's part of this. And he will shepherd. First, he will... Um, strike a single swift sting on the ethnicities, and he will shepherd them with an iron stick, and he is, it says he will shepherd them, and he is tramping on the wine vat. Notice the tenses. All right, so the first one, it says that he may strike, that he's able to strike a single swift sting on the ethnicities. All right, so it, it's not something that's definite. It's something that He's able to do that with that sword. We don't know if, he, if it actually comes about where he has to do that, but definitely he's able to do that. Okay, So that's what we can see from he may, that he may. Then it says he will shepherd them with an iron stick. That's a definite, but it's future. From this, it's future. Because this, right now, says he is tramping at that time on the wine vat of the wine and the passion and the fury of God. With almighty vigor. Verse 16. This is the last verse of this pericope. And he is holding upon the garment of him and upon the thigh of him a name having been written, a royalty of royalties and a lord of lords. You say, oh, the tattoo. It doesn't say that. It's not the same word as tattoo. And it says on the garment of him. You say, yeah, but it says on the garment and upon the thigh. Yeah, but it doesn't mean they're two separate things. What it's saying is that it's on the garment down where it's at his thigh. It's on the garment still, but at the point where it's lying on his thigh. That's where the name is written, on the garment, not on his skin. It's not an etched tattoo. It's a different word. It's a very specific word. It's not used here. So, And it says that he's holding it upon the garment of him and upon the thigh of him. So it's being held on the garment and upon the thigh. And it says, and he is holding upon the garment of him and upon the thigh of him a name having been written. Not names having been written, a name having been written. And it doesn't give any indication it's two different writings of the same name. It's upon the garment which is upon the thigh of him. So you've got to be careful with that. And what does it say? What is that name? A royalty of royalties and a lord of lords. So he's above royalties and above lords. He is the royalty for the royalties and the Lord for the lords. And that ends our pericope of the rider on the white horse.